excited to be here this morning. And Roy James is here sharing Harris, sharing his awesome, awesome anointed music. And I thank God for him. And I thank God for my wonderful husband. I want to wish you a, a happy belated anniversary. <laughs> it was three months ago, but I feel like we're celebrating this week. And I want to celebrate you every day. Yeah. 
three months. Yes. Well, 18 years, two months, and 29 days. But who's going to take And the, I think the cool thing, you know, nobody's perfect, but the cool thing about Joe and I is um, when we met, we were best friends. And I didn't know if we should take that step of making it romantic because all the movies you see, you see romance and, you know, and, and it's not real what you see on TV, obviously, because I didn't want to be with anybody else. I didn't want to talk to anybody else. And Joe, really, you made my life complete. And so I'm just grateful. I'm grateful that I took that step because it's awesome being married to someone I actually want to hang out with all the time. And we like each other. We, it's Amen. kind of strange, it's but important. we really like each other. <laughs> it's funny, it's when, we first, when we first dated, like the first day, she says, I'm a little scared. I says, what are you scared of? She says, well, I, I gotta tell him this. I've heard young women often could hurt an older man. <laughs> First, I wanted to say, who you call no? <laughs> but I said, hey, listen, I'm a big boy. I can take it. No problem. <laughs> I buried one wife. I think I can handle a heartbreak again. No problem. But God's been good. We've been together since uh, January 1st of 1996 as sweethearts. And then uh, Amen. married April 17th, 1999. Yeah. I did want to share one thing that I think is helpful for anybody that's listening. Um, when I first met Joe, I was in the 12-step program. Um, many of you know that I grew up feeling empty and there was a hole in my heart and I sought through music to find love in my life and later on found the Lord at the age of eight. I, I asked the Lord to come into my heart. When I was 15, I, I got to know Yeshua, my Messiah, and um, I didn't know how to love because I had been in a series of abusive relationships. And unfortunately, I was seeking them out. It's like everywhere I went, I would meet an abusive guy. Or a guy that maybe wasn't abusive, but just didn't know how to love me. Um, as they say in the program, emotionally unavailable, you know? And um, interestingly, when I got into the program, it's called Al-Anon. It's for women who, who are sober, who are with men that are maybe gambling or sexaholics or... Um, workaholics. And interestingly, when I got in the program, they don't try to make you leave that person, actually. Um, they leave it up to you and the Lord, uh, whether you're married or you're single, how, you, how the Lord is leading. Um, if you're not married, you can decide to stay or not stay. Um, and I, one of the things I appreciate is they taught you how to love and how to stand up for yourself in a, in a bad situation. So I know that I have friends, and I know they're out there that are feeling stuck in that relationship, and they don't, they don't want to leave. They want to make it work. And the sweet thing is in Jesus, we have tools. We have tools to make it work. Um, and going through counseling, I learned how to love Joe because I didn't know how to receive love. I almost couldn't take it. And I even had to learn how to laugh and play fight because I didn't even know how to receive it when a man said, you're beautiful. I didn't know how to take that when a man put me first. I, I didn't even know. Um, but one of the things that I learned the most that I want to share, is that okay if I share real, real, real quick? I don't want to steal your thunder. No, no thunder. Um, the Lord one. led me a few years ago to put my story in a book called Finding Gold. And I wanted to share with you, because in the back, there's all these tools for finding harmony. And one of the things that I struggled with is manipulation. And I'm ashamed to say it, but in my relationships before I met you, if I wanted something, I would manipulate or hint. And inevitably, I would be disappointed because nobody's a mind reader. Um, Men are bad at hints. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens is when you become a person that hints, if you drop hints to get a hug or you drop hints to get affection, that turns into massive resentment. Massive resentment. And so I had all these resentments, you know, in my relationships. 
And uh, one thing I wanted to read here, ask for what you need. This is a tool that the Lord showed me that's biblical. I'm going to show you how it's biblical. I learned how to ask for what I needed for the first time in my life. Instead of using guilt or manipulation to get a person to guess what I secretly wanted or to read my mind, I simply humbled myself and lovingly asked, what a novel idea. <laughs> it was super uncomfortable sometimes to humble myself like that, but it felt so amazing to finally get what I needed most of the time. For example, if I need a hug from my Joey or my children, I simply ask for one in a sweet and sometimes silly voice. For some people, the risk of rejection does exist, but the chances of getting what you need and the elation you feel when you get it far outweighs the risk. What a feeling. What a feeling. Sorry. The opposite of asking for what we need would be to use guilt or manipulation to get what we want. Or even worse, the opposite of asking for what we need could be to never ask at all. Mm. And then later, to hold that bitter resentment, thinking, they should have known I needed that. The scriptures say it this way, you crave and have not. You murder and you envy, and you cannot get it. You fight and you wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. James 4.2. And Joe wrote this part. The scripture is referring to our asking the Lord. However, if we are encouraged to ask God for what we need, how much more should we be encouraged to ask one another? And I think that tool has made my relationship with you the most rich and the most wonderful. That I could say, Joe, I need a hug. And I could say, Joe, I got a problem, but I just need you to listen. I don't need you to fix it. I just need you to listen. And I'm going to go on for 10 minutes, and I'm going to complain, and I just need you to pray with me. Okay. And, um, and sometimes he does fix it. <laughs> I like the fix it part, too. I do like that. But I just thank God, amen, that God's given us tools in his word on how to love and how to relate. So amen. I'm going to let you take it from here, Joe. Okay. Thank you, Sir John. Um, and looking at the conference, thank you. I'm going to give this to And that song was uh, pretty good. Yeah, it was not good. Thank you. Yeah, praise God. Praise God. My um, friend Keith gave it to a, gave us the tracks as a birthday present. So Keith Kemper, if you're listening, I have to it. I have to thank him. He gave us, tracks he gave us the orchestration. Yeah, isn't that sweet? Uh, just to exhort and summarize, we talked yesterday. Both Pastor Steve and I had basically the same message, and it was so cool. Mm -hmm. But we brought it from two different directions. Mm -hmm. Husbands, you gotta love your wives. And wives, you got to be submissive to your husband because that's what the Bible clearly presents and clearly lays out. This is the key to a successful marriage. And, and I, I, I shared how impossible that could be because we're human. Uh, it's interesting how when you read in Ephesians five, it says you know that Christ loved. Well, let me turn to it instead of paraphrasing. In Ephesians five verse twenty two, it says it pretty clearly. That husbands love your wives just as also Messiah loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her in the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing but holy and blameless. And I just want to stop there because I, I think we all understand the, the importance of a two way street marriage. But with, we have to put the focus on God, on what God does for us. If you look at that scripture, when, when Messiah takes his church, he takes her. He cleanses her in the washing of the water by the word. That means she was filthy. And he cleanses her. And then he takes her and he presents her to himself. Now, what is the bride's responsibility in all of this? just to show up because he is the one that will do all the cleansing and it's funny like sometimes michelle will take a long time to put the war paint on and, <laughs> and i'm like honey no 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 oh don't be telling my secrets no 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 she's gorgeous without the makeup but sometimes she'll take out and say michelle relax you're beautiful just the way you are and 
That's why I think sometimes, Father, God looks at us. We're trying to make ourselves look so good for God. Oh, I'm perfect, God. How do you think I look now? You know, it says the Bible says that God counts the hair, even knows the number of hairs on our head. I made it simpler. Amen. <laughs> he goes, one, two, three, four. Brother Stephen, amen. One, two, three. That's enough. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Joe. But God knows the hairs on our head. God loves the hairs on the, or the lack of hairs on our head. God knows everything about us and loves us just the way we are. And he's the one that wants to clean us up. And he's the one that wants to present us to himself. And it's just an amazing picture of the love of God. And the father loves us. When I, before I became a daddy, I always heard the phrase, the father heart of God. And I never fully understood it just because I wasn't a daddy. But once I became a daddy, then I totally understand it. When Bella was born, within those first 20 seconds, I was in love. That was my baby. And I was so excited that she's mine. I waited a long time, 51 years old when she was born. And 50, no, 50. Oh, whatever. I was in my 50s when Bella was born, and I was so excited. And she was the joy. I'm like, oh, that's the father heart of God. Here's a crazy question. What do you think God thinks of you? If you came from a family where your father ignored you, or your father beat you, or your father was cruel to you, cruel to the family. If you came from a family where a father was... Not even there most of the time. It's a hard thing for people to realize that your father adores you. Father God adores us. He adores us so much. He sent his only begotten son just to die for us. That's how much. And it says the world. This is not just reserved for us believers. He loves everyone out there. You and Facebook. You and Facebook all over. He loves everyone. He adores you. And you are his princes and princesses. And he loves you. He may not like our actions. Because our act, no one here is perfect. And there's a lot of people who are doing a lot of terrible things. But he still loves them. While we were yet sinners, Messiah died for us. If that ain't love, I don't know what love is. Second thing. Do you understand the parental authority of God and how God is a faithful parent? He has authority over us and he's faithful to us. Again, if you came from a family where your dad was sort of an authoritarian, you do what I say, and, 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 and didn't really show that parental authority in a loving fashion. Uh, I had friends who their father was like a dictator in the house. Daddy came home. They sat still. Don't even look daddy in the eye. Just because if you came home cranky, you were going to get a smack. For no reason, because he was angry. And I, I can honestly say, I thank God my father came home. He loved us. But parental authority, again, if you came from a family that was broken, it's a hard concept to understand. Daddy's responsible for you. As parents, as fathers, we're responsible for our kids. Our father, God, he, he's your daddy. He is responsible for you. It's funny, in the, in, the, in, the, in the scriptures, I think in the Old Testament, there are about 300 different names mentioned for God. But Yeshua called him Abba, Father, Daddy. He was Daddy. He wasn't, oh, oh Lord, oh, God. No, he was Daddy. And that was the exciting thing about Daddy. Because he is our daddy. You know, in, a, in a call coming over, I was mentioning, because uh, Tandy would pray with her mother, and they, they recited Psalm 91. That's my favorite psalm. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, and He is the best. My God. Yes, He's your God, but He's my God. How encouraging is that? He's my God. He's my God. There's no other God. He's my God. 
He belongs to me. Yes, we belong to him, but do you realize he belongs to you? Amen. How precious is that to know that he is here and he's my God. And as our parent, I don't have to worry. My kids, they don't worry about what are we going to have for dinner. Daniel provides something. There's, there's food in the house all the time. Daddy will take care of us. My kids don't wake up every morning. Da Mommy, did Daddy pay the electric bill? Do we have enough money to pay the electric bill? They don't worry about that. They're too busy worrying about what Lego they want to build today or what little TV show they want to watch or who, when they want to go to play. We should be kids. We should come to God the same way, trusting and knowing he's got everything under control. <clears throat> How generous do you see your father? If you have a father who's very generous, but added things with little stipulations, oh yeah, I'm very generous with you, but allow me to speak into your life and put you down. Or I'm very generous to you, but you owe me because I did this. How many of you had a father who couldn't care less about your needs? Just took care of himself. I remember I had a friend who, her kids looked atrocious most of the time, but she always had the nicest clothes. If you don't mind, I share yeah. something here. Yes. This is why it's so important to have a good father image in a relationship because, you know, if a man is controlling toward his wife, and again, I don't want to get personal, I have friends and family members who experience this where the husband is so controlling, the wife is afraid, afraid to speak about what she needs. Talk about ask for what you need. And you try and coach that person to ask for what they need, but they're scared. Yep. And if that man of God knew that God is not a controlling, you know, that God is not a mean God, that no. God can show authority with love. When God put restrictions in our life, it's for our own that good. That man would make When a God wants man. to bless us, it's for our own good. When God says yes, it's for our own good. When he says no, it's for our own good. He's not being a mean daddy. God would never yell and say, put that down. <laughs> Where do you think you're going, you know? And so exactly. a husband can say to his wife the same thing in a better tone, the way a loving father would say it, you know. And that, that's all common sense, but it, it's good to put that out there because yeah. I don't think yeah. society today understands the application of what yeah. you're saying, the fatherhood of God. Well, here's a weird question that, here's a weird question that people might look at. Mm -hmm. How attractive do you think you are to God? Mm. Now, I'm not talking about sexual attraction. I'm talking about as a father looks at his child. He looks at you and you're the most beautiful princess in the world. You're the most handsomest prince in the world. Daddy looks at you. Oh, I couldn't have done a better job. And when I hated myself and when I finally, when the Lord healed me of that, because I thought I was the ugliest thing in the world. Now I know I'm the most handsomest man in the world. And guys, please don't get jealous. Please do not get jealous. I, I, it breaks my heart that you know I'm feared by men. But you know, but seriously, I, I say that jokingly, but I feel good. Because I know my daddy loves me with all my flaws. I'm a little short, a little pudgy. Yeah, I wish I was a lot stronger than I am. I wish I could run as fast as I used to. But yes. you know something? Yes. Daddy still looks at me. And you're bringing up something else, a critical spirit. So many marriages, the wife or the husband has that critical spirit. And that's something that I had to undo. Um, growing up in my family, my dad, who's a cupcake now, he's the sweetest man in the universe. I love him to death. He'll admit to it that he had that critical spirit growing up. A lot up. of pressure's on him. And... Um, I think when we first got married, I really had to nip that in the bud because it would just flip out of my tongue without me even, you know, controlling it, just a critical word. or And um, it was so beautiful how we were able, even in our first year of marriage, to I was able to kick that down underneath with the devil and never let it come back because that critical spirit will tear down marriages. Um, I heard someone say the other day, it was so beautiful that we, we need to build up our man Amen. and not nag him. Right. It's so tempting to nag, Holy especially stuff. if you come from a Jewish background, but any background, honey, what are you doing? 
you know, we need to build up the man of God, like Tanya you know, was saying. You know, in the Jewish family, there's always fine Jewish wine Build up. And that goes back day. to asking for what you need, because instead of being critical, I can ask for what I need. I can say, you know, next time, can we do this? Or Amen. next time, can we try that? I want to close in two yes. minutes, but just one other thing I want to mention to you. Daddy, you're the most attractive thing, and he just wants to love you. Amen. He wants to pick you up in his arms like, like a kid and tickle you and bite your <laughs> neck and bite your toes. I have to confess, as a um, Italian, uh, we eat our children. We <laughs> chew on their toes. We chew on their legs. We chew on their faces. My poor daughter, I'm so glad that her cheeks are not damaged, but when she was a baby, I was just like, bite on no her cheeks. No teeth, no teeth. Oh, no, just bite on her cheeks. Like, <laughs> and she'd be like, <laughs> She's a baby, like, okay, I guess this is normal, okay, bite me away, Dad. And I just, and Mike, I just used to love to bite on his ears, like, ah, I don't know this. And now I do it, and he fights me off, like, no, Daddy, don't bite. But then when I leave him alone, Daddy, oh, he loves every second of it. We, we just have to fight, because that's the man thing to do. But Oh, I'm so blessed to have an affectionate guy. But that, that's the affection God wants to give to us. He wants us to sit in his lap. And in this presence, last night, that worship we had, we were in the lap of the Father. Yes. Do you realize that you folks, you know, Steve and Tina, you entered us into the lap of the Father. I mean, people say, oh, we want to enter into the throne room of God. I want to sit on his lap. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I know Isaiah 6 pictures him. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. No, that's the other one. I'm sorry. I, I saw the Lord high and lifted up in the train filled the temple. And you see the majesty of God. And as his kids, get in his lap. Don't walk in there like, oh, oh, how great God is. Yes, we have to respect and fear God because he is the king of the universe. And in the same token, we have to have that boldness of Esther to walk in on the king's throne. And he sticks out that scepter and he says, come on, Tina, sit in my lap. And God lets you sit in his lap. This is what God wants for us. But too often, people are so afraid because they think, oh, I don't want to bother God with this. I don't want come on. If my daughter ever said, Daddy, I don't want to bother you, I'm not bother me. I want to be bothered, God. Romans 10, I believe it is, says, come boldly before the Lord. Come boldly. Right, so nothing beautiful. meek in that. And lastly, does God accept you just the way you are? With all of our flaws, with all of our insecurities, with all of our shortcomings, because nobody's perfect. And whether you're a believer or a non-believer, God loves you just the way you are. He might not like what you're doing and there's consequences to sin, but God loves you just the way you are. And when we yield our lives over to him, we put him first in our lives and we put Michelle second and the kids third, but he's first, everything else falls into place. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, all these things shall be added unto you. So I want to exhort you, the most important relationship in your marriage is the Lord in between. Michelle saying you, and me and the Lord in between. Without that threefold cord, without him in between, we might last, but it's gonna be tough. I wanna share one more thing, if that's okay. I'm done. Um, one of the things that I think is amazing, when we do get draw closer to the Lord, and obviously all of us here are just madly in love with God, I know that. But one thing I'm noticing is that I'm able to say what I mean without saying it mean. And I think that's the most beautiful, wonderful thing about keeping my relationship and my intimacy Amen. with the Lord in check. Because then if I, because I will get angry and things will go wrong, but if I can say what I mean and not say it mean, we're going to have a really good marriage. And um, I, want to close on I know that's scriptural. So I want to close on one scripture then. Mm -hmm. If God accepts us just the way we are. In Zephaniah 3.17, it says in the King James Version, He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love, he will joy over thee with singing. God is going to be singing over us. How cool is that? I mean, we sing praises unto him, and he sings right back. And believers, 
embrace him and get excited about him. And unbelievers, those of you watching in Facebook land and wherever mm. else you're watching, embrace him. And if he sings joyfully over us, then we can sing joyfully over each other. Amen. Amen. Amen.